Thanks, Bruce, for the invitation to present some of the research my group at the Universal Montreal is doing here up in the Northwest Territories. And yeah, the title, thank you very much, Vera, for the uh, introduction. I'd like to acknowledge all my collaborators, students, technicians, etc., that were heavily involved in the work. And to continue with the acknowledgement, my research at the Universal Montreal is part of the Wilfrid Laurier GNWT partnership agreement. It's a 10 year partnership agreement, and the work was generously funded by the Canada Foundation for Innovation, the Fonds de Recherche sur la Nature et Technologie in Quebec, the Canada Research Chair Program, NSERG, and logistics support through the Polar Continental Shelf Program. So a brief outline of my presentation, I'll talk a little bit about boreal forest characteristics and services, boreal forest disturbances, the, yeah, climate change and permafrost, what is the link here? What I think is the link, the main focus is going to be the Tiger Plains ecozone of northwestern Canada and more specifically boreal forest tree cover changes across the Tiger Plains. Then potential consequences of permafrost thaw induced boreal forest cover changes on regional climate with a focus on the southern Tiger Plains and yeah and then we'll see where this goes. So. Overall, boreal forest characteristics and services. Boreal forests can be loosely described as forests growing in high latitudes or high latitude environments underlain by permafrost in figure A. Generally, boreal forests are characterized by a low diversity of tree species with a height of around 5 meter or minimum height of 5 meter and 10% in canopy cover. Globally, they cover about 30% of the uh, global forested areas and a characteristic feature is that they're they contain large tracts of relatively unmanaged forest but with regional natural resource extraction. Disturbances are very important, disturbances such as wildfires or insect outbreaks and they have been essential dynam uh, components of boreal forest dynamics. And critical, so the boreal forests provide critical services to local, regional and global population. For example, locally they're important for hunting, economic opportunities, leisure, spiritual activities. Regionally, they re help regulating climate through the exchange of water and energy. And globally, they stock a large portion of, of carbon comparable in size to, to tropical forests. So, very important. And global change definitely affects boreal environments. Global change loosely defined as yeah, the combined impact of climate change and change related to human activities. So over the course of the 21st century, boreal forests are projected to change in climate space. So in a recent modeling analysis, uh, an analysis of assembled model results shows or suggests that uh, large regions of the boreal forest are overall getting warmer and or shift, uh, are projected to shift to a drier and warmer climate space. Here in red, baseline simulations, uh, in, in blue, sorry, uh, baseline simulation based on 1975 and then on the future climate around over the course of 21st century shown that here on the x and y axis mean annual temperature versus mean annual precipitation yeah the climate space is shifting to drier and warmer climates for large regions of the boreal forest. Here in left a little bit more detail showing for western North America, eastern North America Western Fenoscandia, Western Eurasia, and Eastern Eurasia. And pretty much all these boreal forest regions, maybe with Eastern North America as an exception, are generally becoming or projected to become drier and warmer over the course of the 21st century. And based on these drier and warmer climate space, we can also expect that disturbances, abiotic or biotic disturbances, are becoming more intense, more frequent, more severe. So it's quite a, a wild mix of effects going on in boreal forest environments in North America or globally. Looking at a boreal forest and or looking at a forest disturbance map across North America shows that yeah we have quite a wide variation of different disturbance types in North America's forests and it are pretty much the combined result of interact in the interaction of vegetation, local topography, soil moisture and soil thermal regimes and with newly available satellite based disturbance detection methodologies, what a word, 
and suggests that, yeah, especially northwestern North America are pretty much dominate, or the dominating disturbance type in northwestern Canada or in northwestern North America is pretty much wildfire. If we look at boreal forest and permafrost distribution, we can see that in North America, boreal forest, here the hatch pattern, the northern boreal forest pretty much grows all the way up to the transition zone between continuous and discontinuous permafrost. Continuous permafrost with 90% or over 90% in aerial distribution compared to discontinuous permafrost with 50 to 90% in aerial distribution. In contrast, more southerly boreal forests down here are growing on isolated, sporadic and discontinuous permafrost. And in these more southerly permafrost areas, permafrost pretty much in disequilibrium with the current climate, and its presence or absence is pretty much characterized by local hydrological conditions, by local topography, vegetation composition and structure, and various other factors. And if we look at a rough profile from an old textbook I found, Williams and Smith, 1989, looking at a cross-section of the thickness of permafrost, we can see that the active layers or the seasonally thawed portion uh, decreases with latitude and permafrost thickness increases with latitude. And the further south we go, the more isolated and the more sporadic permafrost it is. So considering that this part of the planet or northwestern North America is pretty much experiencing climate warming at the rate twice compared to the rest of the planet. It has or is currently receiving increased attention by the scientific community such as, as indicated by programs such as above the Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment by NASA that's seeking a better understanding of the vulnerability and resilience of ecosystems and society to this changing environment. Boreal forest and permafrost thawing, especially in the discontinuous permafrost, I'd like to cite uh, the first sentence of a paper published in 2005. Permafrost degradation associated with warming climate is second only to wildfires as a major disturbance to boreal forests. So that was published 12 years or 11 years ago now. But if we look at it in more detail in the southern permafrost zone, so in the isolated sporadic and discontinuous permafrost, using an example from the area around Fort Simpson, we can see that permafrost is degrading and we see this characteristic uh, drunken forest where we have forested peat plateaus with the disappearance of permafrost, saturated soils and wetland conditions. And as a consequence, if we look at this at a regional scale, resulting in overall forest loss. Uh, this here is a photo from a micrometeorological tower that I took near Fort Simpson and we can see the distribution of forested peat plateaus, boreal forest, but over time and with the disappearance of permafrost we have an increased conversion of boreal forest to wetland ecosystems. So overall the landscape is becoming wetter at least at short time scales. The main focus is of the results I'm presenting here is the Tiger Plains Ecozone. Most of you might be familiar with what the Tiger Plains Ecozone is. It covers roughly 500,000 or 550,000 square kilometer and two thirds are dominated by black spruce forests in the lowlands here in roughly in blue elevations between, uh, yeah, between 5 and 250 meters above sea level and by more mixed wood forests in the foothills of the Cordilleran Mountains. The area is influent, heavily influenced by wildfires and showing here is a, uh, is a map and the perimeters of fire occurrences as noted or as uh, noted in the Canadian National da Fire Database between 1965 and 2014 as we can see here on this map in figure C pretty much the entire region was, yeah, was heavily impacted by fire since 1965. So we were interested, how does present tree cover, how does boreal forest cover change across the Tiger Plains? And we were using the annual continuous uh, vegetation field from MODIS, which is a satellite product that's annually released, providing the, the amount of the tree cover per pixel size. And we're using uh, the change in tree cover between the initial conditions characteristic for the year, or oh, there's a typo, 
it should read 2002, so between 2000 and 2002, characterizing initial percent tree cover. And then we looked at the change between this initial tree cover or percent tree cover in 2002 to 2000, 2000 to 2002 and the difference with 2012 to 2014. So we take these two periods and then we look at the changes. And we notice an increasing percent tree cover in the central tiger plains and a decreasing percent tree cover in the, bluer, in the bluer colors in the southern taiga plains. So what were the reasons here? Obviously the area was heavily impacted by fires over the last 30, 40 years. And at the same time we're noticing this decrease in tree cover. So we try to tease apart or disentangle uh, the different influences causing this tree cover change. And our main drivers that we identified were first wildfires recent wildfires occurring between 2003 and 2014 and then post-fire regrowth as a proxy we were using wildfires based on the fire database between 1965 and 2000 and also permafrost thaw using a permafrost sonation index that was published in 2012 so that we can distinguish between sporadic excuse me isolated sporadic discontinuous and continuous permafrost so we bend these over across the taiga plains, we bend the, uh, the percent tree cover here on the y-axis and we were looking at the influence or at the relationship between change in percent tree cover and this permafrost sanation index and the relationship with post-fire regrowth and with wildfires. Not shown here, and I don't have time to go into details, are the linear relationship to explain changes in tree cover based on post-fire regrowth and on wildfires, but we see the sigmoidal relationship between uh, the mean permafrost sanation index and percent tree cover change. And we see here, in the, when we look at the stippled lines, the stippled gray lines, no permafrost, isolated, sporadic, discontinuous and continuous, that we have this decrease here in the blue in, across the, the isolated and the sporadic permafrost zones, but when we go further up higher in latitude we don't see any uh, tree cover loss in uh, in the discontinuous and continuous permafrost zones so we built these models very simple linear models for uh, wildfires and for post-fire regrowth and the sigmoidal model for permafrost thaw to explain the overall variation in here in in uh, in percent tree cover across the taiga plains and we can show with this analysis that combined fire history or wildfires and regrowth, so together constituting fire history, are equally important to permafrost thaw. So permafrost thaw, especially in, across the isolated and sporadic permafrost zones, pretty much explains the, the change of percent tree cover as indicated across scales on, on the y -ax, on the x-axis at the right-hand side, on the right-hand side, in terms of R square, how change, uh, how tree cover, percent tree cover changes across spatial scales. So why why care about this? Why do you think is this important? So the land surface interacts with the climate system um, on two, based on two different mechanisms, globally and more regionally. Globally, through the exchange of long-lived greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide and methane but also more regionally through the exchange of energy and water. So we were interested here in the exchange of energy and water. So what is the regional impact of this permafrost thaw induced boreal forest loss on regional climate? And to look at these things, we're using our main focus is the covariance technique, which is a micrometeorological measurement technique to measure fluxes transported by eddies Flux is the movement of a quantity such as water vapor, CO2, or carbon dioxide, or methane through unit area per unit of time. And we are interested in the vertical flux, which is the covariance between vertical velocity and the concentration of a quantity of interest. In this case, CO2, so carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor, heat, etc. And with this instrumental setup, we can pretty much quantify this vertical flux at high frequencies, so 10 to 20 hertz per second, and then calculate how the land atmosphere interacts with the atmosphere. 
Globally, the AD coverance technique is used as part of FluxNet, which is a global network of regional networks. And when we look at this, yeah, it's a few years old now, 2013, when we look at this global distribution of active flux towers, we can see that we pretty much don't know anything about Northwestern North America, and especially the boreal forests of Northwestern North America. So the area or the region for which we observe the twice the rate of climate warming compared to the rest of the planet. So what do we know about carbon, water and energy exchanges in these remote forests with permafrost? Basically nothing. So the idea with our work is if we look at this map again of boreal forest, here in orange now the tiger plains, we're in the process of establishing a regional gradient of AD cover or of micrometeorological towers. It spans around 2,000 kilometers between central Saskatchewan, then here in northeastern BC, Fort Simpson area, Wrigley area, all the way up to Inuvik. So we have a gradient, 2,000 kilometer of varying permafrost conditions, all boreal forest with no permafrost, isolated permafrost, sporadic permafrost, discontinuous permafrost, and continuous permafrost all the way up to Inuvik at a transition zone between discontinuous and continuous to hopefully shed light on, on these carbon, water, and energy exchanges across this uh, gradient under varying permafrost conditions or rapidly changing permafrost conditions. Results I'm presenting here, more specifically, before there was all about tree cover changes across the Tiger Plains, the focus is on Scotty Creek in uh, a research site just 60 kilometers south of Fort Simpson. It's characterized by sporadic permafrost. And if we look at it, and colleagues of mine refer to it as the front line of permafrost thaw, using a model called the Northern Ecosystem Soil Temperature Model developed at the Canada Center for Remote Sensing in Ottawa. It's a model developed for Canada. It's a it's based on several assumptions that there's only vertical transfer of energy. It's relatively large uniform grid cells, 50 kilometers, and there's no lateral transport of energy, of water or energy. And several studies were published late in 2008, for example, by Zhang et al, suggesting what permafrost distribution might look like in the year 2000 under different climate change scenarios. And here in pink, we see the complete thawing of permafrost by the year 20, uh, 2100. But based on these very yeah, crude assumptions of how permafrost might degrade over time. So, but if we look at the Scotty Creek research site near Fort Simpson, we can see here six kilometer across. It's a very heterogeneous mosaic of different land cover types. And each of these different of these land cover types has a very unique and specific hydrological functioning. So we can see here in green permafrost peat plateaus, uh, forested permafrost peat plateaus, but then we also see quite a range of wetland ecosystems, and they're pretty much permafrost free. Obviously, simulating the southern edge of permafrost based on 50 kilometer uniform grid cells is a it's a pretty crude assumption if we look at what the, what the area really looks like in terms of yeah, spatial heterogeneity. So the Scotty Creek watershed, as I said before, it's, it's about 60 kilometers south of Fort Simpson, and the southern portion of this 152 kilometer watershed is characterized by forested peat plateaus with permafrost around 38% and permafrost free wetlands, so bogs and fens and different lakes. I keep this figure on all the following slides to indicate in the area is characterized by yeah, substantial forest loss over time due to permafrost thaw. Our interest here was what do these fluxes look like, fluxes of water and energy, and we're using a nested tower approach. We have two AD covariance towers to look at the entire landscape. Here in the background we see this taller tower, then in the front we see a shorter tower, so there's taller tower looks at the entire landscape, boreal forest and wetland, and the shorter tower just looks at the wetland. And what I mean by that, I show on the following slide. So we're using this nested AD covariance, or we're using nested AD covariance measurements, different modeling approaches, including a footprint model. If you look at this lower map here, in green, we see the, the source area for the landscape scale tower. So it's this combined landscape signal of boreal forest, with permafrost and permafrost-free wetland. 
And then within this larger footprint, we have a smaller red footprint, so we can only look at the fluxes originating from the wetlands. So, and what we want to know, or what we were looking at in this study was what are the potential effects of permafrost disappearance and associated boreal forest loss on regional air temperature and atmospheric moisture. So what is the impact of this permafrost thaw on, on regional climate? So what are the fluxes doing? So we, what we did, simple regression, or we simply correlated sensible heat flux from the landscape on the left, so figure A, against sensible heat flux from the wetland, and we did the same for latent heat flux. So one characterizing the transfer of water, the latent heat flux, and the other one transferring the, the, the transfer of heat. So we noticed that with boreal forest loss, due to permafrost thaw, we get a decreased sensible heat, so it's below the one-to-one -one line, and an increased latent heat flux above the one-to-one -one line uh, with the increased conversion from boreal forest to wetland. What are the reasons for this, especially across the region? So we were looking at albedo, so it's an important eco or land surface property that characterizes how much solar radiation is reflected back to space. So it's an important control on how these fluxes, how incoming solar radiation or available energy is partitioned into latent and sensible heat. So we use albedo measurements of the comp of radiation components, based on radiation components, and also from MODIS, again satellite based, and we can see that in, during the winter, he, ah, too bad it doesn't work, but in, in gray we see albedo of the wetland ecosystem, so it's exactly this one here, is substantially higher than albedo from the forest ecosystem, because the forest is masking the more reflective snow. And then we have this short snow melt period, within two weeks the snowpack's gone and the land surface, especially over for the wetland, becomes really, really wet and these albedos are roughly similar. But then overall, or in general, with increased forest loss, we become, it's quite obvious, just visually, we can see that this wetland here is more reflective than the boreal forest. So in late winter, there's a pronounced albedo difference induced uh, difference induced thaw related decrease in wetland sensible heat compared to the entire landscape. But then in summer, these decreased albedo difference, the difference between the gray points and the black points is much smaller than in the winter between the gray and the black. So in the, we have a decreased albedo difference over the summer. So obviously other surface properties enhance the, yeah, the post-thaw wetland latent and attenuate uh, sensible heat flux. So obviously, these albedo change, the, the, uh, the continued boreal forest cover loss changes land surface properties and thus the available energy and how it's partitioned into latent and sensible heat. Okay, so albedo changes, it's very important in the winter, most likely less important, I shouldn't say less important, but other land surface properties are controlling how yeah, water and energy is exchanged with the atmosphere. So we look in here, just as an example, in a study published by my PhD student, Manuel Helbig, we, have a, quite a, we looked at quite a few more land surface properties. But just to give you an idea here, so we, were, we characterized the different landscape components and how they respond to atmospheric conditions. And using water vapor deficit and short wave incoming radiation, we can see that with, for different wetland contributions, simply distinguish between low wetland class, medium wetland class, and high wetland class, that um, surface conductance, so an important parameter or land surface property for the transfer of water between the surface and the atmosphere is responding differently to atmospheric conditions as expressed by water vapor deficit and by incoming shortwave radiation. Now, all this, what I've presented so far, we fed into a very simple planetary boundary layer model. So it's a model of the lower part of the atmosphere that's influenced by the land surface to run a few numerical experiments. So based on these measurements for the entire landscape or in these measurements just based for the wetland itself, we can calculate how this lower part of the boundary, of the, of the atmosphere, the planetary boundary layer changes in extent 
and how it, it develops in terms of moisture and also temperature. So using present day climate and present day land surface energy or in, in water exchanges compared to a hypothetical landscape where all borer force is gone and the entire landscape is just wetland such as here. Such we, so all trees are gone, the land surface is relatively wet. What does it mean? So it means what we find with our very simple modeling exercise that permafrost thaw in dual induced boreal forest uh, loss may exert a cooling effect on regional temperature up to three to four degrees, especially in late winter when we have increased sensible heat flux from the boreal forest and along with an increase, especially in atmospheric moisture, especially during summer when this wetland surface here is relatively wet and we have an increased transfer of uh, latent heat transfer to, to the atmosphere. So this here is just an example for one specific summer day, but we ran these, yeah, we ran these little or numerical experiments for a total of around 50 days to look at yeah, different periods of the year and different atmospheric conditions. So to summarize all this, so obviously there are different types of disturbances characteristic for the Northwest Territories, the Tiger Plains, including wildfire, insects, lesser, but they've been integral to a lesser degree, but they've been an integral part of boreal, foral, uh, boreal forest ecosystems. In the low-lying black spruce forest in the sporadic and dis uh, discontinuous permafrost zone of Northwest North America, we see that permafrost and fire history appear to be equal and important drivers of boreal tree cover changes, especially in the southern part. Then global modeling studies, as briefly presented at the beginning, project a general shift of boreal forest regions to a warmer and drier climate space. But authors also indicate that there are large regional, regional uncertainties and a lot of variation. And with our measurement setup of nested eddy coverance tower in combi combination with satellite remote sensing, we show that local uh, and regional consequences uh, of, for boreal forest characteristics and services may vary considerably among different regions. And for the southern tiger plains we find that permafrost thaw induced forest loss may modify regional precipitation patterns if the atmosphere is getting wetter and at the same time at least regionally are able to slow down regional warming trends as projected in global studies. So where are we going with this? The next step is along this transect between southern Old Black, a site called Southern Old Black Spruce and Central Saskatchewan all the way up to Inovic. We're having a more detailed look at the tight link between changing permafrost conditions and hydrology and how they affect plant water status, tree water status and functional traits and, and as a consequence also boreal forest productivity across northwestern North America as indicated here for the above study domain in, in red. All this is part of, as a next step, of CANET, CANET led by Dr. Phil Marsh at Wilfrid Laurier University, also part of the GNWT Wilfrid Laurier Partnership Agreement. It's uh, to improve it's a CFI funding, funded project to improve in, instrument and infrastructure at research site across the NWT, including the tower sites along this transect, but numerous other sites with different infrastructure units to look at ecosystem resilience, forest responses, permafrost, carbon fluxes, the full range of uh, yeah, research directions here. And the idea is to enhance the understanding and prediction of ecosystem processes across the mainland Northwest Territories with the objective to develop an understanding of the long-term, key here is long-term stability and resilience, so to continue observing ecosystems. The measurements I've pre I presented here were based on two, three years, so but the key is to look at what happens in the long term. So to develop a fundamental and integrative knowledge of present Arctic and boreal ecosystems and to develop and apply integrative models, not what I've presented here was a relatively simple planetary boundary layer model, but we need more integrated and integrative models to look at potential future ecosystem responses uh, to climate warming and, and disturbance effects 
and also to engage northern communities to build adaptive capacity and resilience in the face of climate and landscape change. So again, it's a joint program between Wilfried Laurier and the GNWT. And yeah, it, uh, Kenneth will help instrument in our laboratories in Yellowknife, Simpson, Fort Simpson and in Novik. And it's pretty much starting in the next few weeks from what I was told just recently. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>